what's great about these clean camera hooks, the way that that hook is bent down, it actually forces the body, it forces the entire abdomen down into the film. So whenever you have a traditional, we'll say an Adam's parachute that's tied on a traditional dry fly hook, even though you, you look at it and you're like, oh, this is going to be riding down in the film, it really doesn't. It kind of rides right on top, maybe a little bit into the film because those hackles will keep it up and you have a tail that's going to, again, keep it close to the surface. But with a clink camera hook, it's going to force the bend of the, of the hook because it's metal. It's going to force that down into the film. That was Tim Camisa on Matching the Hatch with the clink hammer, a little emerger, a little fly tying, and all Camisa today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for checking out the show. You can check us out right now on social media at Wet Fly Swing, and you can leave a uh, review or comment uh, on any of the social media apps. Wet Fly Swing, just send a DM or uh, click a like, whatever you can, just let me know you're listening to this episode today. This episode is sponsored by Angler's Coffee. Angler's Coffee roasts a full range of coffee with one goal in mind, delivering excellent coffee to every single angler. With a blend of every taste, a dry dropper on the go tea bag option, and a roast sampler, you know Joe at Anglers has you fully covered. You can head over right now to wetflyswing.com slash anglers to support a sustainable company with unsurpassed taste. That's Anglers, A-N-G-L-E-R-S, to get started right now. We are also sponsored by Deddy Flies. Established in 1928, Deddy Flies is the oldest family-run fly shop in the world now in their 94th year. Deddy's mission has always been to support the fly fishing community with the finest products and services. Every fly they sell is either tied in-house or by a handful of select domestic tires. Please head over to wetflyswing.com slash Deddy to grab your flies today. That's wetflyswing.com slash Deddy. D-E-T-T-E to support this podcast and the oldest fly shop in the world. Tim Camisa with over 25,000 YouTube subscribers on his fly tying channel shares some tips from his new book today. Tim shares the four new and not so new fly tying materials for the 21st century. We find out which thread is best, which hooks are best, and a few tips on selecting flies from his book, including the famous Muda Puda. That's Muda Puda, one of the best and biggest in YouTube tying game, and back for round two. So without further ado, here is Tim Camisa from TroutAndFeather.com. How's it going, Tim? Dave, it is great to be back. I mean, I, I feel like I have been on this podcast for like years. I mean, was it season one? Was that yes. when I was last on this? Yes, you were. I just looked it up. It was episode 25, and which was season one. And that was, uh, we're actually, I think you're going to be like, th- what are we at now? 285 or 286, I think. Oh my, listen, you were giving me like a complex thing and I must have done a <laughs> terrible job. This guy's not inviting me back. Wow. No, no, not at all. No, we, in fact, I've only had a few people. That's been the fun thing. It's been all new guests over the years, but we've had a few that we brought back. And I remember when I did your episode because I was like, okay, Tim, he's got this big YouTube channel. What am I going to cover? And it was kind of random. You know, we, we covered a little bit of steel we touched on all this random stuff, but today we're going to really dig into, because since then you've written a book on fly tying and obviously that's your wheelhouse. So we're going to, we're going to dig into a little bit of that book, but before we get there, talk about, you know, June of 2018, that's when we talked, or at least we did the last podcast. Wow. You know, what have you been doing other than COVID, you know, what's been new with you? <laughs> okay. Well, first let me go back and I hope all of your listeners know everything I'm saying is in jest. Uh, Dave, you run a great podcast. I don't think people understand how much time you put in behind the scenes, but honestly, thanks for all you do. I mean, oh, there's yeah. so much information in your podcast, so we really appreciate it. Appreciate that. And um, since 2018, man, I I don't even know where to start. I mean, over the last few years since we've last talked, there have just been so many avenues I've been able to go down. As you mentioned, I just recently published a book uh, by Stackpole Publishing. It's called Fly Time for Everyone. I know we'll get into that. That's been a, a just a major piece that w- it took a couple years to kind of come into the making. Uh, my YouTube channel channel has grown considerably. So it's been really great to, to basically to lessen this steep learning curve that is fly tying and fly fishing. Because 
man, it, they're just wonderful sports. We want to get so many people involved in them. And, you know, I've continued doing the fly fishing shows around the country. This year I'll be in, in Denver and in Edison, you know, helping giving instruction, uh, giving fly tying and fly fishing demos and just helping others out. I've been, had a couple articles published in some magazines. So uh, trust me, I've been busy and I've also fallen in love with this thing called TikTok. I oh, mean, wow. I, it, I feel like it, this is something that I should have been doing 30 years ago or, you know, when I was about 15, but man, it is like so much fun. And that's, you know, just something else to investigate and have fun with and, and help others, you know, throughout this process. That's awesome. So is TikTok now, that's the, is that the one where you, you have to dance? I don't dance. Let's <laughs> let me be very clear. I mean, the yeah. gist of it is it's like under a minute. They're they really they're kind of entertaining shorts. I mean, think of it in that that sense. What's really nice about it, I try to blend mine between entertainment and education. I think they call it like edutainment. I think that's, that's right. the name for it or something like that. And yeah. and the gist is, you know, I want to make fun of fly fishing, but I also want to give some information in a very short amount of time. So for people who have very short attention spans, they probably already love TikTok. For everybody else, YouTube is the place. Well, that's the cool thing about audio is I think people probably feel your energy right now, those that don't know you, you know. Um, but that's what you see with those videos. I mean, I see sometimes I'll see a clip of your video and I won't hear anything, but I'll just see you, your face talking. And I mean, you can see the passion and the like just the way you talk. So, I mean, I'd imagine if you're watching a bunch of those things, you're kind of digging in and getting people fired up for, you know, whatever topic. I mean, how do you make those educate in that, such a short clip? What do you do? Do you just pick one tip typically and dig into that for a minute? <sighs> Yeah. I mean, I have a couple different ways. If, if we want to dig into this, I mean, yeah. number one, whenever I first heard about this notion of TikTok, I was like, what is this? I don't understand it. So I, I just downloaded the app and I started watching some, uh, I was kind of blown away because my day job is I'm a sixth grade math teacher. So I teach, you know, 11 and 12 year olds and all of my students have TikTok. And my first few TikToks that I viewed were definitely not something I would want my own child to watch. So I was like, I, I didn't love the, I didn't love that aspect of it. So I just tried to concentrate on those that were around fishing or the outdoors. And I kind of drew my inspiration from others, just kind of seeing what I was drawn to, like the types of shorts where maybe there's some sounds and, and the sound has like five or six high notes. And on every one of those notes, this person pointed to a word on the screen. And I was like, well, well, I can do that. But instead of making mine funny or about a holiday or about my wife, instead it could be about my favorite flies that I use. So, and I try to end with something funny, like I always sort of throw a mop fly or squirmy wormy in there, you know, so I'll have the, the stuff that I always use, but it's also fun to kind of make fun of things too. I mean, there was one where I was holding a steelhead. Um, it was, I was doing some content for this company and I have this steelhead that I'm holding and this thing just went absolutely insane in my hands. And I, <laughs> and it was one of those things where I'm like, do I want to post that or not? Right. You know, but, but it's also yes. the, the, you know, the aspect of, we're not perfect. And, no. and I also want to point that out to people. I mean, I think people who've watched my YouTube channel over the years, I mean, I have people at the shows, Dave, who come up to me and they're like, Tim, you are such a phenomenal tire. You don't make a mistake. And I was like, you know, I edit that stuff out, right? Like that stuff doesn't, it doesn't make the camera. So every now and then it, it, I think it's nice to kind of poke fun at ourselves and, and let everyone else know that, Hey, this is kind of, we're all in this together. Let's have fun with all this stuff. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. There's so many, uh, like we were talking off air, yeah, there's so many ways to dig into as far as the content. That's cool. You're you're finding something that that's resonating there. So I'll, I'll definitely check that out. I'm not real active there, but um, I that's another thing that I could definitely uh, <laughs> get started in, in the new year. Be um, careful. Another addiction. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I'm curious, you know, the book, obviously this, you know, today we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, update of what you've been doing. The book, I think, is interesting because – you know, obviously, there's tons of people that fly. Most people that do, you know, fly fish, a lot of people, you know, tie flies, and that's always a struggle, you know, getting into this. So tell me, and this isn't going to be just about, you know, selling the book, but this is going to be about like learning, you know, some tips and tricks from the book. Yeah. Um, and we're going to be talking about that here. So talk about, you know, first of all, why did you do the book? Because the book I've had, um, you know, recently we had, um, you know, a Cheech on for fly fish food, and we talked about the book, you know, and it was like, you know, I asked him about, you know, are you going to be writing a book anytime soon? He's like, I'm not writing a book. He's like, my YouTube videos, <laughs> I could reach like, you know, X times, a hundred times more people through YouTube videos. You know, and he's like, it's just not me, the book. So it's a ton of work. Uh, and I know people love writing. So why did you do the book? Just start there. Like why the book and why not something else? 
Well, first, let me go back. And it's funny you talked to Cheech about it because I also talked to Tim Flagler. He's one of my YouTube idols. And I said to him the same thing, like, when are you going to write a book? And he was like, that is not for me. <laughs> and it's it's funny that I don't look at it from the, the reach of the book because a book is more of a long term. You know, you're going to be helping people for so many years down the road. And I think that, that's it's not about reaching every single fly tire out there. It's about just help, helping to, you know, again, like I said, lessen the, the learning curve for others. Yeah. But Whenever I thought about the notion of writing a book, I've always thought about it, Dave. I think many people do, but it's not something that I, I was going to say, you know, I was going to write in 2020 or 2021. That wasn't a goal for me. It was like, I'm going to be a teacher. I'm going to retire, maybe write a book, kind of like a John Gierak style. Like, that's what I'm going to do. And um, kind of out of the blue, Jay Nichols uh, reached out to me and was like, hey, do you know anyone who would who could write a book on fly time? And for your listeners, Jay Nichols, he's kind of a legend in the industry of fly mm-hmm. fishing and fly tying. He was publisher of Fly Fisherman magazine. He um he owns his own you know publishing company now. And for him to even you know kind of put that out there, I waited on the message. I mean, it was a Facebook Messenger message. And Dave, I sat on the message because I, I'm thinking. I think Jay probably meant to send this to somebody else. He can't be, he can't be talking about me. So I just waited for him to like delete the message or something. And, and I waited and I waited and finally I replied and we, we had a conversation about it and his selling point, because it was kind of his idea. I mean, I'm not going to take credit for this. He just thought I could be the person to really roll it out. And it was to look at this in terms of let's, let's back up. You and I just talked about social media. Mm -hmm. I mean, so many of us go to YouTube, Instagram, Facebook to learn how to, tie flies, to be inspired by patterns, to learn how to fish them. But the issue that so many have is that number one, it's overwhelming. And number two, it's not truly vetted. Anyone can go out there and post a a picture of a fly and say, this is the best fly in the world. And they may never have even fished it. So we have to take that step back and say, there's all these patterns that are out there which one should I use if I'm if I'm new to fly fishing or if I'm trying to improve my fly tying techniques to go from a beginner to an intermediate? What should I be focused on versus just picking flies that look prettier that somebody says are good patterns? So we try to look at this as can we put together a baker's dozen worth of flies and through those flies teach tying techniques from the basic to intermediate to, to some even advanced techniques throughout this book that it's not a step one to step 50 book where it's really just 13 patterns that I don't just tell you how to tie them. We go through the materials. We talk about variations. We talk about, most importantly, how to fish the flies. And they're generalistic. So whenever we talk about dry flies, I talk about some strategies to fish those. It's the same thing with emergers. I have a lot of urine nymphs and even some streamers, including an articulated streamer in here. So I wanted to just I wanted to make it more than just a step-by-step tutorial on a few flies. I wanted to really break it down and then in the beginning, I talk about the essential tools. I talk about random tools that you'll find on my tying bench. And I also try to give just a little picture of what it's like to tie in in today. Like, what is fly tying like today? Because, again, I was thinking long term. I know somebody, I, I pray somebody in about 50 years is going to pick up my book. And I want them to read one of my first chapters and just say, oh, what was fly tying like back in 2020? Like, what was it like? Because right. I don't even know what it's going to be like in 2030, let alone 2070. I, no. I mean, it's just mind boggling to know how much we've grown in the last 20 years, especially even the last decade. So I'm just so curious to just kind of know where this book will kind of fall in line with everything else going on in the history of fly tying. So that's kind of, that's the, that's the, the story behind the book and, and selecting those first 13 flies Man, that was the toughest part for me. Yeah. Aside from the photography, I mean, macro photography, that was something that was brand new. So I really had to up my game there coming from video. But once the macro photography was down, it was like, all right, cool. I got my macro photography. I'm I'm really good at writing. I had a pretty consistent, you know, writing voice that and I could kind of have my voice come out in the text. But it was finally like, which flies should I showcase? Because they had to have techniques in them and they had to catch fish. I didn't want to just put pretty flies in here. And Jay also was very clear. He didn't want a book that just talked about flies that were already tied. Like there's no parachute atoms in here. I mean, there's 20 books that teach you how to tie that fly. So we wanted to put modern flies with modern materials that caught fish. And Jay was really cool about the whole thing. There was only one fly. He was like, you have to put it in here. You have to have a paratagon. And, oh, yeah. and he, he's right. It's it's a killer fly. So for your listeners who don't know much about a paratagon, and we can talk about it today, but that was the one he was like, you got to get it in there. Everything else, he was like, hey, use your expertise and see what you can dig up. And that's how it came together. That's it. That's a great summary of how that that came together. And 
you mentioned essential tools. We uh, we've had a few episodes on fly tying, obviously, over the years. Recently, uh, Mc, the McFly angler uh, Sean was on. He talked about kind of some uh, tools. Uh, we dug into like some budget tools and stuff like that. And we had um, Tim Flagler was also on recently, which was a killer episode. Oh, yeah. Definitely excited about that. And um, yeah, and I was th- kind of thinking today. I know you have a topic. Uh, I think you talk about like fly tying. Like what is it, like twenty first century fly tying materials? Is that a section in your book? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's something I think is kind of interesting because I, I love the materials thing because I know, you know, that there you go. 21st, that's a great chapter or whatever, because things have changed a lot since, you know, whatever back in the day. And so I'd love to dig into a little bit on that to talk about some of those materials and, and maybe we'll get into some flies as well, because it is curious to know. I talk about like your top two flies a lot for guests, but this is your top 13 for a book, which is amazing, <laughs> right? Like, how oh, do you yeah. do it? So that, oh, but yeah. let's start with the materials. Tell us about, bring us back to that chapter and maybe first um, just guide us through a little bit. The book is for a beginner or is it kind of for, you said for everyone. So it sounds like it's for everyone, but like, how do you make that book for everyone? Dave, that was the toughest part. And I think that's uh, the feedback on the book has been phenomenal in that I was able to somehow make it. So if you're brand new to fly tying, you're going to get an overview of everything and you're going to learn step-by-step instruction. But if you're a beginner trying to move to that intermediate phase, you'll be able to kind of sift through the information and, and dig into some of the details that I've I've kind of placed within them because I have all these tying tips that are located throughout all the sections where it kind of tells you like, hey, if you want to go to this next level, you should be focusing on this. And then at the advanced phase, I, I'll be honest, I mean, there's just a kind of a, I don't want to say a splittering of a few advanced techniques and tips throughout here, but I really tried to within about three of the patterns, just give you a few little things that just would you, you wouldn't think about like for, for instance, for the articulated streamer, I mean, for this articulated streamer, instead of having a shank and a hook, I decided to have two hooks. And I also, you know, I was very cognizant to say that you have to make sure you check your local and your, your legal restrictions to make sure you can fish, you know, two hooks. But if you can, I, I talked about, well, what should the two hooks be? I mean, most people will just grab, will say two size six hooks and they'll attach them together with wire or some other material versus I was like, well, for an advanced tire, that's not good enough. And, and we have to talk about why should the front hook be larger than the back hook? So instead of me just saying, all right, well, you should have a larger front hook. I reached out to who I believe is one of the better articulated tires of today, Gunner Bramer. And I was, I picked his brain. I was Gunner, <laughs> give me some information that, that the average person wouldn't know about them. And he was like, oh, well, let's talk about this front hook, Tim. Like for the front hook, you have to have it larger because if you're going to put a head or something, then it's going to make the body of the front up here smaller or shorter than the body of the back hook. So you want to keep it proportionally the same size. Hence, you need a larger hook up front. And I was like, oh, like, that's really awesome. And that, like, that's something I didn't know. And I've been tying articulate streamers for years. So I try to p- try to pick some some of the experts' brains and insert that information. I mean, I talked to people like Devin Olson, who's considered one of the great, you know, Euro, Euro fly fishers in our country. I mean, he's one of our top competitive anglers. So I have a section kind of dedicated to one of his flies. So instead of just saying, hey, I'm just going to give you all my information – I also reached out to people that I look up to and I pulled information from them. So you know, there's a combination of a lot of information in this book. Yeah, no. So basically, yeah, this book is not just you. It's a com- it's other people. That's what makes it interesting too. So, and I noticed some of the comments and, and reviews and, and, uh, and I guess some of the, I, I think Devin, you had a few people, yeah, that, that actually highlighted the, the book and things like that, which is cool. Let's start with uh, those materials if we can. Let, let's just dig into and talk about, to give somebody a perspective, if they're, you know, they're tying and they got their normal stuff on their fly tying desk and they're thinking about something, you know, what's out there that's new or what you're tying with. Can we talk a little bit about that? Maybe give them a list of things that you, you describe in that book. Yeah, well, I'll go over like maybe how about the four or five main kind of 21st century materials that I think really stand out. The first one, there's no question about it. It's the notion of whenever I first started tying flies and I, I know, especially when you and I both got into fly fishing, it seems like there were so many natural materials that just always took precedent over synthetics. Yep. And that's something that has really slowly started to change. I mean, you could you could argue that synthetics have been a, around for decades, I mean, through tinsels and other ver- versions of plastics. But I've really started to see so many more and more tires turning to synthetics for a variety of reasons, but mainly because it's very consistent. You can buy a pack of whatever material X at one fly shop, and you can buy the same material somewhere around the world. It's going to have the same coloration for the most part, and it's going to have the same material density, and your flies are going to look identical. And and that's part of the the allure of synthetics is that you can make consistent patterns that will that are repeatable over time. Mm-hmm. Now, 
the argument against it you know, with natural materials is that natural materials tend to breathe a little bit better in water. They may not be as durable, but they just seem to have more of this lifelike ability to them. But the tricky part that I've realized over the years with, with many natural materials is that it's really tough to select natural materials and know what you're doing, especially at first. I get so many people that will reach out to me and they're trying to maybe tie an X caddis or an elk hair caddis and they, they have this deer hair or this elk hair and they're like, it's just not working. And I'm like, well, send me a picture. Let's, let's, let's mm-hmm. figure out what's going on. And they do. And I realized they have the wrong deer hair. Maybe they have deer belly hair. So it's just spinning and it's, it's not wrapping at all like it's supposed to. And it's really tricky for them to figure it out because in my videos, if I say, Hey, tie this fly with deer hair. Well, what kind of deer hair? What right. color deer hair? How fine should the deer hair be? Versus if I say, hey, I want you to use this material from Semperfly fly tying. It's like, bingo, I can go to my fly shop. I can go online. I can order it. It's going to be here. My fly is going to look pretty close to Tim's just like that. So I think that first, the notion of having very consistent material today, we're really fortunate as fly tires because synthetics have changed that game. And probably the biggest synthetic game changer I've seen over the last few years has been UV resins. I mean, the notion of the, there, there are just so many of these resins that we have to do so many different things now, because originally, whenever I thought about tying flies over 30 years ago, hmm. I mean, you would not put super glue on a fly like that was like a no, no. Like, could you imagine a salmon fly tire acknowledging or admitting they put super glue on a fly? Like, <laughs> no, like, no. And now here I have a, like a book and on one of my dry flies, I have super glue to make sure the thread stays in place. And it's wild to know, like, it, it's, it's great to know that. My perception has changed of adhesives, but now whenever I we kind of introduce the notion of these UV resins, man, has it changed things? And by a UV resin, imagine it's it's kind of like a clear resin. It'd be something maybe even your dentist has used on you before if you've got a filling and they they stick this UV light in there and it it, it cures it and it, it's extremely hard and it's extremely durable. I first started experimenting with this stuff. I think the brand that I, I first turned to was called Solaris Bone Dry, and I used it on the Paragon. And it, it's this like little brushable, it's kind of a liquid. I mean, it's almost like water. And I, I tied this Paragon. It was a really slender fly with a, a tinsel body. And I just put like a few drops of this and kind of brushed it over everything to the point where it made my fly look wet. And as soon as it was wet and I didn't have anything dripping below, I would just take a UV torch and just, you know, shine it, shine on it for about 10 seconds. And that was it. And this fly was like instantly, like just, it was diamond strength. I mean, it just was so hard and ready to fish and it didn't crack or anything like that. Then I started learning more about these epoxies and, and these UV resins. So you can use them to kind of hold on eyes if you're going to be tying streamers, or you could use them to create an entire bait fish head. And it was cool because unlike epoxies, which is what I'd used years before, if I was going to build up a saltwater fly and I was going to build up the head or, or make some type of a body with resin, it would take hours to dry. I'd have it on my little slow turner and that little thing that I'd hear the motor in the background and I have to make sure, you know, it was turning at a certain speed. So that resin would be cured the proper way. Now with these UV resins, I mean, I click my flashlight and it's dry in like 15 seconds. I mean, it's literally ready to fish in 15 seconds. So just from the notion of, of speeding up time, man, it has completely just changed things for me without a doubt. That's really cool. I'm glad you started with that one. And I, you mentioned, I guess we're talking about the patterns. Uh, so what patterns in your book did you use uh, the UV? Red, I guess I'm thinking of one. Did, did you use on a lot of them or was it just a, one or two? Yeah, I used it on quite a bit. Let me, uh, I'm just kind of thinking through all the flies that I have in the book. I mean, I know for sure the Paragon. there's no doubt about it. Now the, the dry flies, I don't think I had any on the, um, the two dry flies that I feature in the book. I can tell you many tires, what I'm noticing now, they're using stuff like bone dry and they're actually placing it on their thread. And they're whip finishing or just turning their thread at the head of the fly, snipping it, and then curing the thread at the at the head just to keep it. That's kind of like their um, – their, that's their super glue at the head or that's their uh, head cement right now. That's people are using UV resin in place of head cement. So it's kind of cool to see that. I, I chose not to for the dry flies. Um, for the emergers, there's an emerger in the book. I think it's one of Devin's flies. And he actually coats his fly with super glue versus UV resin. You could use UV resin in place – the reason we chose to use super glue instead was because super glue tends to soak into the fly and it made the entire oh. fly more durable versus UV resin tends to sit on the outside of the gotcha. material. That's so that was the reason he chose super glue for, for the fly that we shared. Um, then kind of going through some of my Euronyms, I think about half of them featured it in one way or another. I mean, there's one of the flies, is a, it's a CDC quill body jig. 
and quill bodies are, it's basically from a peacock quill it's a dyed quill body and they have this really great coloration i mean they, there's this they create this awesome segmentation in your bodies the downside of quills is that they are really fragile the way that we tend to protect them is to just counter rib a wire or something else but an easier way is just to coat them with uv resin so i, I just put a little bit of resin cure them then continue to fly and i mean you have just just a beautiful look to these uh these quill body materials so that's without a doubt. That's that's, that's the it. one that I loved. And then for some of the streamers, I think there was one that I tied that was, gosh, actually in two of the three, there's an articulated streamer in in the book, and for the articulated streamer, I connected the two hooks with wire, and I actually used resin to seal the wire to adhere it and lash it after I placed my my thread wraps. So that was one one instance where I used it there. On the head of that articulated streamer. Um, Gosh, it was one of those skulls. I can't remember the exact name of it. But one of those flymen fish skulls. And there's these eyes on it. And whenever I cast these things, I bang that head on rocks. I mean, I try to cast this as close to shore as possible. And those eyes are always falling off. So I actually coated the eyes with a type of UV resin just to keep them locked in place. And then the final, one of the final flies that I tie is an extreme string bait fish fly. And I believe there's been instances where I used to put a lot of resin to kind of form the head. But in this case, I used craft fur for this fly, and the craft fur was tied with the tips coming over the eye, and then I actually bent them back over the eye, so the tips, it kind of created this round head at the fly. And I put this clear mask over them, and what happens over time is that that clear mask will eventually get loose and it will fall off. So the way to prevent that, I put some of this UV resin underneath the mask, basically along the hook shank, then I put the mask over it. And because the mask is clear, your UV light will shine through it. And it was able to kind of cure that mask to the hook. Oh, right. I mean, it was a it doesn't it doesn't work if you have a mask that's you know not transparent. But in this case, it was, and man, it came out really good. I mean, it's, go. a, it's a really cool fly. Let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsor. The CRC system from Trestle provides secure and convenient storage for your fully rigged fly rods with unsurpassed gear protection. Every CRC system comes with secure mounting clamps, padding, and the reel compartment, their proprietary suspended rod liners, and more. Leave your gear on your vehicle full time or quickly take the CRC system down and telescope it into carry mode in just a few minutes with their easy to use system. From the very first time I connected with John, I knew this was going to be a good fit. And since then, I've got the CRC system I've been testing out, and it is definitely bulletproof. Um, this thing, I've got it right now folded up in the back of the truck. Uh, it's not on top of the car. It's in the back, and it actually still allows you to put some rods in the case. And uh, once I get my secure uh, mounting rack for the top, I'm going to put it on there and be good to go. So I'll be checking back with you once I get to that point. But uh, carrying the rods with the reels facing up um, means more protection for your guides, your blank reel seat, and uh, also allows for if you have a hatchback, allows you to use it on the hatchback. This one definitely is packed with all sorts of features. Um, but you're going to have to head over to Trestle right now to check it out for yourself. You can go to wetflyswing.com slash Trestle to get started today. That's Trestle, T-R-X-S-T-L-E. You support this podcast by clicking over through that link to check out John and the crew today. Okay, back to the show. So, yeah, it sounds like, you know, the UV, obviously, that's mentioned four or five that you would highlight here as game changers. Yeah. Absolutely. I think next, um, whenever I think about fly tying today, there's no doubt about it. The, the threads in fly tying have changed immensely. And, and probably the, mo the more popular threads that I'm turning to on a regular basis are called GSP threads. And that stands for gel spun polyethylene. What's nice about these, I mean, I think back to whenever I was learning fly tying and I can just picture myself tying a fly and I'm getting really close to finishing it. And all of a sudden my thread pops yep. and all of my materials just like unwind and i'm just staring at this thing i just spent 20 minutes on and it's nothing it's ruined and i just i, I just i can visualize i can go back in time and see this and now we have so many of these threads that are very fine diameters but have a very high breaking strength and one type is called gsp so because of that i tend to recommend these to a lot of beginners especially something like a 12 watt or even an 18 watt um, it's called nano silk by semperfly 
And it is just like, I don't want to say the Cadillac of fly tying thread, but that's what it is. I mean, I travel around the world and to fly fish. And whenever I travel, I always bring a fly tying kit. And what's nice about these threads, I only need to bring like a white and a black of like 18 aught, you know, wow. Semperfly Nano Silk. That's it. Because that will pretty much cover 90% of the flies that I'm tying whenever I'm out there. And I can get away with, you know, using something like an 18 aught, even though it seems like such a fine diameter, it's got this high breaking strength. I mean, I think I tied the articulated streamer in my book with 18 aught just to show people that you can, because people are so used to using like three aught or six aught. And I'm like, now with this, this new thread, you can actually, you can really bear down on it. And in many cases, you're going to break the hook before you break your thread. So for people who are, are new to fly tying, don't feel obligated to go to like a six aught, you know, wax thread because that's what everyone tells you to. You can use these GSPs and they're not going to break. That's that's a, the beauty of this modern thread. Well, wow, that's a huge tip. Yeah, I mean, because that is you know, back in the day, right? I mean, the I always think of like the the uni thread. And I'm sure they've got other stuff now, but you know the you know like yeah, like eight. What was it? I guess six aught, eight aught. I mean, ten aught. You get up there, you're starting late. Like you got to be careful, otherwise you're gonna snap that thread. So you're saying this stuff, eighteen aught. You're using that on big and small flies. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of crazy to know that you can get away with a tw- like a twelve aught is almost like a, a that's like my go to size. That's like an yeah, average standard. size for me my right now. There's there's no doubt about it. I mean, I think I talked about you know Gunnar Bramer, you know, talking about this fly and whenever he first read the section on the articulated streamer, he texted me. And the first thing he texted was, dude, those are some small hooks and the really small thread, man. And I was like, oh, I'm so glad you said that because I'm going to quote you in the book with that. But nice. Even he was like, you can't use 18 aught for streamers. And, <laughs> Perfect. and it's like, yeah, y- you can. So yeah, you can get away with using stuff like that. I mean, if you're, if, if one of your listeners is new and they're like, I, I want to start with one, start with 12 aught. Semperfly Nano Silk, or find another company that that you like. And by, as, by the way, I want to also give a full disclosure. I'm a, an ambassador for Semperfly. That's why I tend to recommend their their products first. Sure. There are lots of other GSP threads out there. They're they're just the ones that I use. But I would go with something like a 12 watt black GSP. And man, are you going to love it? The, the tip that I'll give for fly tires out there whenever you're cutting GSP, really hold it under tension and then trim. Because if, if you leave it kind of slack and you try to cut with your scissors, it's not going to cut unless you have very sharp scissors. So just kind of hold it tight and then snip it close to the hook and it will trim with no problem. Gotcha. That's an awesome one. Yeah, that's a sweet tip. Uh, let's keep this going here. What would you have for uh, another like number three here? Okay. Number three. Oh, let's see. Oh, there's two that are like neck and neck. Let's go with hackle today. I mean, oh, I yeah. spent the beginning nice. of this and I said, Dave synthetic, that's where it's at. And then you look at fly tying hackle and yes, like, Oh my gosh. I mean, again, I, I'm going back almost 40 years and I'm thinking like some of the first hackles that I had, like the high end hackles that I remember, like I begged my parents to buy and they're like complete garbage compared to the hackle today. And I think people should know that we are living in such a fortunate time where we could we can find hackle that has these super long f- feathers with lots of fibers, lots of barbules on them. And man, are we just so fortunate. I don't know about you, but on Instagram, I love to follow Sun Tao. He's a oh, friend yeah. of mine. Yeah. And when I see him tie his stimulators and he uses this hackle and the hackle is like 12 inches long, he'll tie like three stimulators with this piece of hackle. And I, like, I can't even fathom that from 20 years ago, but we're, we're living in an age now where we have these saddle hackles that are just so incredible. But now let me, let me take that step back. And I'll also say, as I, as I told you earlier, when it comes to natural fibers, I get tons of emails, like which hackle should I use? Do I use a Cape? Do I use a saddle? Do I use a hen? Do I use a rooster? Like which one do I use and what, for what flies? And that therein kind of lies the problem is that we have this wonderful hackle, but sometimes people aren't quite sure which ones to to use for the appropriate pattern. So that's why I always say if you see somebody on social media and you see they tie with, you know, with a certain hackle and you're like, I want to tie that fly, like send them a message, shoot them a DM or something and just say, hey, what hackle is that? So I don't buy the wrong one because yeah. – Hackle can be expensive too. I'm telling you how great it is, but you got to pay up for it. So I, I always recommend to others, you know, if you're thinking about getting some new hackle, I mean, without a doubt, contact me. I'll, I'll tell you some of my favorite colors, but also see if you have a friend that you could split it with and just buy a full hackle and, you know, use a razor blade and slice it down the back so that you each get a half. And gosh, that half is going to last you for a very long time. Yeah, for settle. Yeah. And, and are we talking, uh, Tom Whiting, obviously, but we had him on a while back, and that's the, kind of the is that that's kind of the gold standard. I mean, there's a few companies. Is that what you recommend, or are there are others out there? 
Yeah, there's a lot out there. I mean, you know, Whiting is is absolutely phenomenal. I think Keo Hackle is also some of the best. I mean, there's still some really great, like smaller labels out there. I mean, there's a guy in New York. His name is um, Charlie Collins, and he sells this hackle that's called Collins Hackle, and it's like like one of the original strains from New York. All so right. a lot of the, the Catskill tires love his. Um, I, there was a company that I worked with years ago called Clearwater Hackle, and they went out of business. But then somebody recently, you know, repurchased the company, and they're coming back out with some some really cool stuff, including some JV Hen Hackle. So yeah, there it's Whiting is great. There's no doubt about it. But there's some other ones out there that I'll, I'll kind of keep pointing to as well. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I, I love that you mentioned Catskills. I whenever I hear that, I'm always like, that's always been my struggle. I've never, you know, been that great at tying the, the nice, uh, you know, those styles of, of dry eyes. What is it just, I mean, obviously there's a, there's a lot to it, but I mean, yeah. that's the number one thing, getting the right hackle for the job. Is that kind of it? Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, and, and we all make mistakes. I mean, I, I think I love to tie parachute dry flies mm-hmm. and, um, and I like to tie kind of fish them like in a merger. So I want like a really specific, like variegated, you know, modeled hackle whenever I'm buying this, like basically a barred hackle is what I like to use on a lot of my parachutes. And I was at a, I was at the international fly tying symposium in November and, uh, Mr. Keo was there who, you know, who owns hairline and owns Keo. Oh, right. And, and I was like, Hey, Bill, I need to, I need to get some hackle. He's like, all right, what are you looking for? So I told him and and it was funny, Dave, because he and I were kind of going back and forth. I was like, this is the one I want. And he's like, but what you're telling me, this is not going to work for you. And I'm like, yes, it will. Uh, you know, you know, Dave, I'm like, I, I know, Bill, I know, even though you, this is what you do for a living. I know. Oh, and sure enough, yeah. I got home and I was like, darn it, this is not the right hackle. Like he was hundred percent right. And I didn't, oh, I wow. wasn't even listening to him because the color of this, this hackle that I had, I, I bought a saddle and it was just absolutely stunning. And I, I kept looking at it and I even picked up some of the fibers and I was like, I think this is going to be large enough, but for parachutes, you kind of tend to oversize your hackle a little bit. And he knew that. And he's telling me, Tim, this is really small. And I'm like, no, no. And again, I'm still living in the past at times where I'm thinking this hackle, they say small, but small to these guys is like 16. And All right. no, this was like 18s and 20s. I mean, it was a complete saddle loaded with 18s and 20s, which again, just shows like, Yep. Oh my gosh, his hackle just phenomenal today. So I, I got to shoot Bill an email or give him a call and tell him he was right. There you go. There you go. Uh, you mentioned, uh, d- take a little uh, break here from this this list we're working on. Uh, you mentioned the parachute, fishing a parachute like an emerger. I'm curious, what does that, um, give us a little rundown of what that entails. Like Because I always think emergers, you know, obviously it's an emerging bug, but how would you fish a parachute like an emerger? Yeah, well, there's a couple different ways. Probably the most common way is it, it's based upon the hook. There's a hook that style that's out there. It's called the clink hammer hook style. And imagine kind of like a scud hook. So it's got a really sharp bend to it. And whenever you tie a parachute on a clink hammer hook, if you tie it typical or traditional parachute style, you're going to have this parachute post. We'll just say like an Antron or a Zelon post with some hackle wrapped around it. And that's going to be really kind of set near the, the eye of this clink hammer hook. But what's great about these clink hammer hooks the way that that hook is bent down, it actually forces the body, it forces the entire abdomen down into the film. So whenever you have a traditional, we'll say an Adam's parachute that's tied on a traditional dry fly hook, even though you, you look at it and you're like, oh, this is going to be riding down in the film, it really doesn't. It kind of rides right on top, maybe a little bit into the film because those hackles will keep it up and you have a tail that's going to, again, keep it close to the surface. But with a clink camera hook, it's going to force the bend of the of the hook because it's metal. It's going to force that down into the film. And now to, to talk about emergers, the notion of an emerger is an insect that's hatching. It's, it's making its emergence to the surface. Now, when flies, when these insects get to the surface, there's an extreme amount of tension there. I mean, for you and me, we can dip our hand in the water. We have no problem. Mm-hmm. But for an insect trying to come out, it's extremely tough. But whenever it's sitting near the surface, it's also very vulnerable. And what we're trying to do is, is show these fish, hey, I have there's a vulnerable insect at the surface. It's right. attempting to hatch, but it's stuck in the film. So by using these clink hammer style hooks, and there's other brands of them out there, uh, and there's other, I should say, other names, not brands, because clink hammer is a style. But when we use that clink hammer style, it really forces that that body to kind of almost be look like it's facing down into the water. And that's that's really the key that that I tend to stick with whenever I'm fishing emergers. That's cool. So yeah, so if you were fishing like say, I mean, I don't know. I mean, obviously like, you, you know, there's different orders and families of bugs, but like say a caddis emerger, I mean, is there a typical style of fly or is this, could this overlap through all different insects? Yeah, yeah it definitely can overlap. Um, the one I, I would kind of caution people whenever I think about 
we'll say something like a, a caddis fly versus a mayfly because those are the two main the, the, and we don't want to get down too far no. down that entomology <laughs> rabbit hole. Right. I know some of your listeners are like, no, 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 don't do this to me. <laughs> but for a mayfly, they tend to have more legs and not more legs, but whenever their their legs tend to be more prominent on the surface versus uh, a caddis fly. The caddis fly is known to have a very prominent wing that goes back like a tent. And, and that's almost something that as a fly tire and as, fly, as a fly fisher, we, we tend to believe that the fish cue on that anyway. So we, we prefer to have styles of flies like the X caddis. So that would be a, a fly that I recommend to people all the time. A pattern like the X caddis where you have CDC underwing that's going to kind of show some movement. It'll be all those CDC fibers will be dancing on the water. We have a deer hair overwing, which is what we kind of use to sight, but also that creates that illusion of the wing. And then underneath that, we have a body. And if we tie it on a clink camera hook, it's going to be really got kind of at a steeper curve going down into the surface film. And then the, the trick of all this is to put something like a trailing shuck at the end. Uh, instead of a tail, we have a trailing shuck tied with like an antron or a zelon. And what that represents is whenever this caddis or the mayfly, they both go through this a similar process. As they get up to the surface, they have to get out of their nymphal skin and crawl out of it. And what happens to that nymphal skin is that they're still attached to it. Now, that nymphal skin doesn't carry any more protein, but it sends a trigger. It sends a, a cue to the fish like, hey, I'm trapped right now. Hmm. I'm stuck to this skin. <laughs> I can't fly away yet. So when the fish see that, they're like, oh, like this is game on. Like Here's my peanut butter cup on a conveyor belt about to pop into my mouth. So I'm going to rise up to the surface and eat this. Now, what stinks about this as a fly fisher and so I'll just try to try to plant, try to paint this picture for some of your listeners. If you're ever fly fishing during a hatch and you see a bug that eats, we'll say a caddis fly adult or a mayfly adult on the surface, and you make some cast to that and you're just not getting anything, if they're just ignoring you completely, what we tend to do is like, like oh, it's got to be our fly. So we put on a smaller fly or it's got to right. be my tippet. They can see my tippet. So you put on a different, you know, a, a greater X tippet, or we even change our location. But the one thing that we don't always recognize is that there could be something hanging off of that adult done in the water, and we don't even know it, but the fish can see it from their vantage point. So that's why I, I tend to turn to mergers a lot more than others in hatch situations. There you go. No, and you had a whole, uh, I know recently, a podcast on the Orvis podcast, right, where you talked to all mergers. Is that one, that one was a recent episode? Yeah, that was one. I mean, I'm kind of, no, I don't want to say I'm known as to give um, a lot of presentations for mergers, but... I give a lot of presentations to groups around the country, both uh, in person and via Zoom. And um, because it's so popular, I always I always feel bad because um, people want to learn about emergers. It's just an aspect of fly fishing that is just difficult to understand. Mm -hmm. And clubs are always asking me to give that presentation. Oh, really? So I've given it so I mean, I've given it, Dave, I don't know, over 50 times around no the country. Oh, it's a very popular presentation at, at a lot of the fly fishing shows at the symposium. That's one of my go-to presentations they ask for. I mean, I have like 50 presentations, but that's the one that they, they always want to see. So I'm glad um, we're not covered that. I'm glad we're not covered that today. <laughs> it's a great one. It's just loaded with information. But yeah. the, the gist is because there were so many groups that were, you know, wanting this, I realized, you know, maybe a viewer of mine from from my YouTube channel who lives in, I don't know, Missouri or who lives in North Carolina, they probably are not going to have a chance to ever see that presentation. So I was like, well, let me give a virtual class. So I gave a virtual class where you could just purchase it through my website. And then after it was done, people could just buy the link because I recorded it. And it went over really well. It was extremely popular. Like it's still for sale right now. It, it was just a, it, it was a really great idea. Now I'll go back to the, the, the Orvis podcast because that was run by Tom Rosenbauer. And he did just, he's, he does another really great job with his podcast. Well, Tom had like said to me, Tim, I want to do a podcast on fly time. Are you in? I'm like, absolutely. And just like with all the podcasts, you know, I try to get my, my head in a good space. I have all my notes that are ready. I practice what stories I'm going to tell, just like I did for this one today. And I'm like, all right, I know what I'm going to do with Tom. And then Tom, like four days before, is like, hey, by the way, I was on your website. I see you do a mergers. Just let's cut fly time. There We're just going to I'm like, oh, you're killing me, man. I'm awesome. just all ready. So, yeah. but it was, that was a lot of fun. He has, a, he has a lot of fun in his podcasts. And that's you. Tom does a great job, obviously. And I, I always find that that's the best thing I always try to do on the podcast is like, okay, you think of a topic and it's good to stick with, you know, a topic, I think, because people, you know, are coming for a headline or something, but also feel free to open it up, right? If it goes somewhere yeah. and change it, because that's interesting too. So, you know, on that note, you mentioned um, Antron, Zelon. What, what is the difference for somebody that doesn't know the difference between those two? 
I have no idea. I mean, okay. there, Dave, there are websites devoted to talking about why Xelon is better than Antron or one sinks and one floats. I, I have a whole bag and my bag is, it, it's labeled Antron, but it's loaded with Antron and Xelon and Aunt Lydia's yarn and EP fibers. Right. And I use it all interchangeably. Um, I know there are some very slight differences in, in the way that it, I believe in the way that it's extracted, but I would tell the average fly tire, don't get caught up in that focus on, you know, the color. And, and if you have a chance to look at the fiber, try to select a fiber that's a little stragglier versus straight. I, I tend to like the ones that are a little bushier fibers versus gotcha. those that are really straight. Whenever there's straighter types of, of that material, I tend to use it on bait fish imitations, uh, but whenever it's stragglier and it's, it's just fuzzier, then I like to use that as a, as a post or as a trailing shuck, something along those lines. Would that be something similar? I always think of like hairs mask or something like that. You know, the old, uh, standby where you got the guard yeah. hairs and stuff like that. Is that kind of the, where you would, you're saying you'd want to maybe not have the straighter guard hairs where it's more, um, is that kind of what you're going? I'm just curious. Kind of. Yeah. It's, it's tough to explain, but it, I, I'm telling you, I have an entire Ziploc bag that's just like loaded with all these fibers. And there's like three or four that are the only ones I ever use just because yeah, they, they tend to like grab my fingers whenever I pull out this Antron or Z line or e, or EP fiber, I almost have to take a comb and just kind of like brush it out and almost make it straighter. If that makes sense, because it's just so, you know, wrapped amongst itself. So that's, that's the fiber that I tend to really turn to. I don't know. And again, this is, and let's also say this to all your listeners, this is complete personal preference. You can probably talk to somebody else tomorrow and they'll say, nope, I like the straight stuff that never, you know, that never right. comes together. And it looks just like the Velcro. Like, you know, everyone has their own opinion as what works for them. I just tend to go with this. And I also tend to use really like hotspot style colors whenever I'm thinking about parachute posts, because I want to be able to see the flies. I mean, the, the parachute post is more for me. And there's some people who say, well, that that's going to represent the wing, you know, or it's going to represent uh, the mayfly adult wing yeah. and, and the fish are going to see that, which I believe in situations they can, but there's, I, I know if I can't see my fly, I don't care what color it is. If I can't see it, whenever they hit that fly, I don't have a chance of catching the fish. And at the end of the day, I'm trying to catch the fish. And especially in a dry fly situation where you, you're not, you know, tight to the fly, I got to be able to see it. So when you look at my dry fly box, even though there's a few in there that, that might be like a blue done color, the vast majority are like hot pink chartreuse. And then a sneaky color that I, I use a lot is black because it seems like in a low light situation, I can see black for some reason. It just silhouettes really well under certain lighting conditions. So, you know, don't be afraid to use that. But white is a color I used whenever I was I was younger, but I don't use it so much because it starts to blend in with other whites that are on the water, especially water bubbles. So yeah. I, I would recommend if you're gonna go natural, go with like a like a blue dun style color, something that will just blend in a little bit. Otherwise, you know, go with something you can see. That's another killer tip. And, and on that line, so if you're out there fishing and there's a, a nice hatch coming off and fish all over the place and maybe you can't see it that well, what, any tips there to, to hook up to know when to set the hook on a fish on your fly? If you, I mean, right, sometimes you're like, oh, I missed my fly. How do you know? Do you just kind of set and hope? Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the biggest tip I have, aside from the set and hope or aside from using a hot spot, um, I, I think about whenever I was in Montana, I was fishing on the Missouri River and they were taking a lot of really small flies and there were bugs all over the place. And it was really difficult to see our fly. So instead of like saying, hey, well, let's, you know, instead of just trying to close our eyes and just, you know, raise our, right. our rod every three seconds, <laughs> we kind of went the other stance. I was like, well, let's put on a large dry fly. And then let's put on our smaller fly, you know, 12 inches or 20 inches below that. So all we had to really identify was where's our large dry fly. And then let's, and we're kind of using that as the, the dropper in a sense. And then that small fly was the point fly. And, and as soon as you could identify your large fly, then you knew your small fly was, was oh, 20 nice. inches from there. And yeah. then you had a, a visual cue to say, oh, I know it's in this area. Now I can focus right around there. If I see a rise form anywhere around there, lift. And that worked out really well. I've kind of now jumped into the notion of Euro nymphing and I use it for dry flies as well. So I actually have a, a Euro leader that's kind of a, it's a dry dropper leader, but instead of saying I have a dry fly for my dropper and then a Euro nymph for my point, I have a large dry fly for my dropper and then a small dry fly for my point. And I kind of use that as really my dry fly leader, especially in situations where there's a lot of bugs on the water or where it's low light. There you go. Another good one. Well, let's let's get back to this uh, lit and try to wrap this list up here. We got um, uh, we have a few here. What what else would you add as far as materials? These twenty first century materials are the game changers. 
Oh, let's see other game changers, man. I'm looking, I I'm thinking about my book and I have like three or four more in there, but I would think probably the biggest game changer. I think we kind of touched upon it already. Um, for us today, it's, there's no doubt about it. It's the hooks that we have available oh, to hooks. us as tires. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know. I think, I think the notion of, com, you know, competition and competitive fly fishing has really changed the notion of how we fish and so many of the flies that we use. I'm not a competitive fly fisher. I've never been to a competition. I've never, uh, you know, competed against others. I mean, I, I have against my friends is, you know, like who's going to catch the most fish, but that's, you know, just all been a joke. But I do know that I think we can all appreciate a really good hook. And the fact that the notion of this competition has really forced these manufacturers to say, we need to create better hooks with maybe wider gaps that are barbless with more consistency. Those that don't bend out those with ultra sharp hook points. And they're here. I mean, I talked about the the notion of European nymphing and I just love to use Euro nymphs, but in, I live in central, I live in Western Pennsylvania. I fish in central Pennsylvania. There's a ton of pressure on the waters and I'd love to fish in those pressured situations because when you catch fish in those situations, you feel like you're doing something right. right. But in those situations, I tend to go to smaller hooks. We're talking like size 18 and size 20 jig hooks. But I can also tell you that in some of these spots where I'm fishing, there's larger fish. And a few years ago, if I hooked a fish on a size 20 jig hook, I can 100% guarantee you that hook was going to bend out and I yeah. was going to lose the fish. The, the, the quality just wasn't there for the hooks that I was using. Now, if I use a size 20 scud hook, it was there, but not jig hook. Well, in the last couple of years, I mean, there's a company that I'm associated with. It's called Hanak Hooks, H-A-N-A-K. I mean, they're like the Ferrari of hooks. They have a size 22 jig hook that I've caught 24-inch fish on. I mean, that's it's like unreal. Like It's always cool to say, like, oh, I caught a big fish on a small hook. But on a jig hook with a wide gap, I mean, that's just complete. It blows my mind. So, the 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 notion of we have these incredible barbless hooks because uh, you know I'm a proponent of catch and release, and I tend to to use uh, you know barbless 99.9 percent of the time. So the notion of we have these quality hooks that are out there, they they can hold big fish if you're into that. They have like super sharp points. I mean, they're here today. So. I, I try to tell, I try to instill this with so many people, like try, don't, don't go too cheap on hook. I mean, it's that last connection between you and the fish. You want to make sure that if you, if you hook that fish of a life, you want to make sure you get it in. And there is nothing worse than losing something on a hook that you had control of. So, you, you know, be happy with these current hooks we have today, even though it stinks to pay the price. I'm like, sometimes Dave, I go to buy it. I'm like, Oh, this is for 50, you know, and it's, it's not for 50. Sometimes it's for 25 and you're like, yeah. Oh, that's so much money for 25 hooks. But whenever but you land a fish, it. I mean, every time I land, there was, a, I had, I, I host trips to Iceland every year and I, I hosted one this last July and on the last day, or maybe the next to last day, I hooked a really large fish in a lake on a really small jig nymph. I mean, I was nymphing in this lake and, um, it was like a 16 or 18, um, size hook. It was a jig hook. And the whole time I'm fighting, I'm like, thank you so much for using that hook. Like for, I selected that hook because I knew oh, it would right. hold fish and I landed this fish, you know, I got a picture of this fish and I was like, it's because of that hook. Like if I would have fished another brand of hook, it probably wouldn't have held this fish, but that one was able to, I landed a 23 inch or with no problems. It was just not a single problem. So kind of keep that in mind. Like whenever you do hook that fish of a lifetime, man, it really makes a difference. Let's take another quick break for a word from our sponsor. The Fly Fishing Film Tour is back. Don't miss this year's 2022 F3T as it returns to theaters near you for another season on the water. For me, I definitely remember the first time that F3T came in and it was a super cool event. Got excited for, uh, I remember connected with Elliot and the Drake podcast at the time when Elliot was running that show and um, just kind of connecting backstage with the crew and the event, having the beers and hanging out with the friends. Um, just to watch some good uh, anglers, some good filmmakers, and some stories on the big screen was pretty much about as epic as it gets. So I'm definitely excited to share the event this year and excited that F3T is on as a sponsor for this podcast this year. Please head over to wetflyswing.com slash F3T to find a show near you and get a super dose of inspiration as you plan your next big trip. We're going to be planning some big trips this year. We've got some big trips on tap. So this is your place to go get some inspiration, see what others are doing, and then come back to the podcast and listen to more of what we have going. 
Check it out. That's wetflyswing.com slash F3T, or you can just head over to flyfilmtour.com. Okay, back to the show. Yeah, that's the whole thing, I think. You, you spend a lot of money on all these trips, and if you look at it, that comparison, you know, spending a little more on a hook makes sense because, yeah, you get that fish of a lifetime. You want to get it in and, and get a look at it and all that stuff. So uh, what do you do? I'm just curious on the leader. So if you're using a 22, 20, whatever, big, uh, small hook, what, what's your tippet look like? How small are you going there? Well, it just depends on where I'm fishing, you know, how fast the water is, how deep I need that hook to go. I mean, whenever I first got into Euro nymphing, and, and that's kind of, we're, well, I'll talk down that path because I think it really ties together. Whenever I think about European nymphing, it's not just you grab your typical nine foot five weight, you know, you have your traditional fly line and you have a traditional leader. It really, you kind of have to calibrate everything. And that's, there's a mad science to it, which could be a little tricky for people at first. So for any of your listeners who are thinking about getting into it, you know, please reach out to me via my website, troutandfeather.com. And I'll try to help you get things calibrated because that's without a doubt, the trickiest you know piece of this. For me personally, I tend to use something like a, a 10 and a half foot three weight. That's my go-to rod. And what's nice about these Euro specific rods um, they're, they're kind of tuned a little bit different than a traditional rod. There are so many fast action or medium action rods on the market today, but I go back to, gosh, my days of yesteryear, I used to build bamboo fly rods and some of my favorite fly rods were these, this, but was, were by this maker. His name was Dickerson and the Dickerson rods were known to have kind of a stiff butt and a flexible tip. And that's how these Euronymph rods are, where you can imagine like a, a butt. It's not this simplistic, but imagine something that's like a five or a six weight butt section and then like a two weight tip. So you have the ability to, to kind of you – can, you can land a really large fish on these, but you also have this really flexible tip to protect your tippet. So that's kind nice. of step one. Okay, that's so that's, that's step one. So then now to go out to our tippet, I don't use a traditional fly line. I use basically a level line. That's that's really what these Euro-specific lines are. Um, there's some You can use these really long leaders as well, but I just like the notion of you know feeling fly line whenever I'm fishing. So I, I use kind of a level. It's a, a fine diameter fly line. And then I have a variety of leader formulas that I use on a regular basis. Um, but imagine that we have this leader that for the most part is almost like a, a level leader, maybe – we'll say 12 to 15 pound, almost the whole way to a cider section. And by a cider section, we have this we have this monofilament that has different colors in it, maybe pink and chartreuse, and it's barred with those different colors so that they, they grab your attention when they're in the water. And then you have that, and that's attached to maybe something like a tippet ring. And a tippet ring is just a really small piece of metal that looks like the letter O, and you can just tie a piece of tippet directly onto that. What's great about the tippet rings is but whenever you your tippet starts to get smaller, you don't have to use a certain knot to get it back on. You can just trim it, and then you can you know tie with whatever your your go to knot is where you tie on your hooks. But you can attach it to that tippet ring that way, and you're not going to shorten the length of your leader at all. So that's the beauty of a tippet ring. Now to go to the the tippet because this is I'm getting back to your question. I promise you, when I first got into European nymphing, my go to size was five X. Like that, I used five X fluorocarbon. Pretty that was pretty much my my size. Then I eventually started going down to 6X because I realized the, the more fine diameter tippet, the faster your fly will sink. So I went to 6X. And then a couple of years ago, I had the chance to fly fish with Pat Weiss. He's a, a member of Fly Fishing Team USA. He's, he's a guy that you will not find too often on social media. I've invited him to, to you know be on my YouTube channel a number of times. He comes up with an excuse every time why he, he won't. He's just he's a complete predator. I mean, this guy catches fish. And I had a chance to fish with him for the day and he pretty much used nothing but 7X. And I was like, all right, I guess I'm going to 7X. So if if, if you see me in Pennsylvania, I'm probably going to be fishing 7X. Okay. If I go out west, like I was in you know Wyoming, I was fishing on the, the North Platte there. And I think I was using 6X and it was just, it, I was undergunned using 6X. I was able to catch more fish than others, but I couldn't land as many of them because it was really a fast water situation. Oh, so if right. it's really fast, then I'll probably back it to, you know, to 6X, 5X, depending on where I am. But I kind of live in that 5 to 7X range right now based on the water speed and the clarity and a lot of other factors. The only caveat would be if I go to articulated streamers, then I tend to bump it up to more like a 3X just something where I know that tip, it's not going to break in the hook eye. There you go. That's awesome. So yeah, there's, and obviously we've, we've touched the surface on a lot of this stuff, but if you know your book and I'm curious on uh, the video, so the flies, you, you've got, you know, 13 flies there are all those covered in on your YouTube channel as well. 
No, they're not. Actually, Jay and I went back and forth and we were like, hey, do we do we share the flies on, on video as well? And we kind of were like, hey, video is awesome. I mean, I love YouTube. Um, I, I think you mentioned the notion of, you know, Cheech and his YouTube channel. You can get so much across in a video. In a book, I felt like if I could really break each step down and really just elaborate on each step versus a video. I mean, so many people, they yell at me. They're like, Tim, you talk way too much. And I'm like, I know, I'm sorry. That's just what I do. But in a book, I was really able to keep the information concise, but truly just kind of brush out and and really just fine tooth all that information step by step. So the short answer is some of them are found on my YouTube channel, but you're not going to, if you search for my book and, you know, say fly from, you know, Tim's YouTube, it's not going to come up that way. I mean, you just have to know which flies are in the book and then find them that way. Okay, perfect. And I know you talk about a little bit like some tips and techniques. I'm curious, can you give us a couple of maybe bonus tips, uh, you know, from the book, something that, you know, again, somebody's tying here. Maybe they're thinking, okay, I'm going to do some jig. I'm going to get some jig hooks. I'm going to get some uh, GSP, right? Oh, this is all good stuff. <laughs> yeah. what, what would you tell them if they're out there, they're still struggling? Do you have any general tips that you tell, or maybe you want to dig into a pattern or anything that kind of resonates here? Well, I'll give a couple quick tips. All right. Here's a, here's a couple tips from the book. So fly fishing, there's, um, there's a tip in the, or there's a, a pattern in the book called the Muda Puda. Now this fly, it's, it's from Curtis Fry of Fly Fish Food. So this is Cheech's buddy. There it's a go. Curtis Fry pattern. It's a really killer pattern. I actually use this throughout the uh, cicada hatch as well. It worked really well during that too, but it, it can represent a variety of terrestrials. And one of the tips that I share in the book, whenever you're fishing terrestrials is that sometimes when they land on the water, they don't land gentle. I mean, this is a dry fly and we think about dry flies, they land gentle and the fish come up and they sip. That doesn't always happen. When when beetles land in the water, they sometimes land with a thud, with, with a big plop. So one of my tips whenever you're fishing terrestrials, not necessarily ants, but especially beetles and hoppers, drive the fly into the water. And I like to cause a disturbance. And at times, if I know there's a fish there, I'll actually cast and create a plop below the fish, downstream from the, fl- the fish. And I've hooked many large fish that I've cast downstream from them. I've created this plop and the fish has turned and just like just annihilated wow. the pattern. So that would be a nice little, we'll say a dry fly tip that I'll give some of your listeners. Awesome. Um, let's see for a, gosh, what's another good tip I can share? Let's do a uranymphing tip. How about that? Yeah. We'll do a, we'll exactly. do a uranymph tip. I mean, there's so many out there. The one tip, I'm not even sure if this is in the book. I'll just give you guys, this will be a bonus tip. How about that? Mm-hmm. Nice. Um, nice. The beads that I like to use are called slotted tungsten beads. And when you pair those with a, a jig hook, they tend to cause that jig hook to ride hook point up the majority of the time. But let's get back. Jig hooks today, man, they, they can be expensive. Um, I know it's it's a commitment. I, I know probably you're the same as me. I have thousands of hooks that I've you know just acquired over the years. And it stinks to say like I have all these nymph hooks and now I'm just never going to use them again and turn jig hooks, which yeah. I've kind of done. But there's kind of a sneaky shortcut with that as well that you don't have to do. I would recommend instead of buying – jig hooks. That's fine if you don't want to commit yet, but go out and buy a bunch of slotted tungsten beads. And there's one side that kind of has just a circle in it and the other side has a slot. But what I've realized with these slotted tungsten beads, if you place them on a traditional nymph hook and you turn the hook upside down in your vise, that bead, if you push it around a couple of times, it will eventually set in a way where it will, cr- it will cr- make your traditional nymph hook look like a jig hook and it will cause it to ride upside down. Now, there's a couple of videos on that out there. I can't remember what the exact video is, but if you put a drop of super glue by the eye, slide that slotted tungsten bead up, invert your hook so it's hook point up in your vise, and let it sit there, you'll see that it will it will actually create a, a nice significant gap. And then that the majority of that slotted tungsten bead will be on the, we'll say the top part of the shank, if that kind of makes sense. And it will help that fly invert when it's in the water. So you let it dry. You can put some UV resin. You can jam your thread up against it. And it's a really sneaky tip. And I can tell your listeners that there are many competitors that when they tie on YouTube, they use jig hooks. But when they tie for competitions, they're still using their traditional hooks because they'll get a better gap out of their traditional hooks with that little tip I just gave you. Oh, right. There you go. That's another cool one. And I, we, uh, yeah, Cheech, I mentioned we had him and Curtis uh, Fry was on a while back as well. I, I, it's interesting. The, uh, what'd you call it? The Muda Puda. What do you know that the naming there, that's quite a, quite a name. Gosh, if I do, I, I don't know it off the top of my head. No, I don't know. They have a, they have a video on YouTube about it. I okay. mean, it's a killer fly. No, there's no doubt about it. Yeah. The Muda Puda. So I'll, I'll uh, follow up with that a little bit there. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, 
there's so many you know ways we can go down this road. I mean, obviously, it's uh, fly tying is a huge field, but is that when you were writing this book, were you thinking of you know how, how do you consolidate it all into you know one book? Or you, know, you got all these topics. I mean, or do you feel like you covered a little bit of everything, or did you just touch the surface of a few things? Man, I, I guess I looked at this like everything I could tell you for these patterns. I try to put it all out there because. Mm-hmm. I know personally, I read books, I'm, I collect books, I love fly tying books. I mean, I learned from many of them. Even I learned in person, I learned on, you know, from videos, I learned from books. And I don't know about you, but there's nothing worse than where you have a book or you have a, you're watching a video and you feel like they're holding back and you just feel like you're not getting the full story. I don't know. I just felt like there's some books I've read over the years where it's like, well, you gave me some stuff, but I felt like you kind of held it back. Like there's going to be a part two. I don't know. It's like when I saw the end of the back to the future movie and I was like, it said to be continued. I was so mad. I was like, how can you do that to me? (laughs) That's right. And and I didn't want to do that in this book. So, I mean, I try to leave, try to get as much information out there because in the, the world of fly fishing and fly tying, I mean, information has always been so valuable. And I feel like, you know, in, in days past that information, it was highly valued, but because it was held back by so many, it didn't further our sport. And I feel like recently, especially in the last maybe decade, what, you know, one of my mentors is George Daniel and George has been so upfront and just out there with information. I feel like he's the one who kind of started the modern trend of just giving you as much as he knows. I mean, he wrote this early book on, on European nymphing and it was packed with so much information. It was like the Bible. And I know of so many people who just, who are still picking that book apart because he just, he put it all out there and he wasn't afraid to say, this is all I know. I'm giving you everything I know because George was confident knowing like, I'm going to go back and learn more. Like that's, you know, he, he was somebody who wasn't, he, he, you know, he's, he's not willing to just say, I've made it. I'm there. Like he, he, you know, he kind of, He took the notion of like Joe Humphreys or Lefty Cray who knew like they were going to learn for the majority of their lives. So I kind of took that same approach where I tried to pack as much as I could into these 13 patterns, probably too much. But I want you to know like what were some good things about these flies? What were the tips? What were the techniques? And also I share some like some downsides of them too. Like for instance, there's a picture of an articulated streamer in the book, Dave, that it was one that I caught my largest arctic char of my life on or I hooked and it broke off because I never – I never tested the shank to make sure it was a secure connection. And and I thought to myself, do I want to show a a failure in my book too? And the short answer was, yeah, I don't want to, I'm not going to hold back. I want people to know this is a mistake that I made. Like, don't make this mistake yourself. And I, I, so I talk about like how you can prevent making some mistakes with, with flies like this. So I tried to leave as much as I could, you know, in these pages and, it was, it was a lot of work. There's no doubt about it. it it's a lot to kind of give it your all, but man, I, I'm already, I'm excited to make another one. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, you are? Yeah. I can't wait. So you're going to have a, there's going to be a number two book out there. I hope so. I mean, I, I promised my wife I would wait a little bit of time because for, you know, for your listeners sake, I wrote this during COVID while my wife was pregnant and I have a son and I teach sixth grade. I was basically teaching on zoom and this book was happening, you know, early mornings at 5.00 AM or once my, you know, my wife and my child went to sleep, I was downstairs taking pictures. So this was a book that was really written, you know, away from my normal life, but I still had to fish during that time. And I still created YouTube videos. So there was a lot going on in my life at this time. And I didn't want to rush it. So I did not meet the deadline. I was a couple months late. I felt kind of bad, but I was like, I don't want to rush this just to get it in. I want to really make sure everything is ready to go. And it was. So I'm now kind of just enjoying it, you know, learning some new things right now. And I'm going to talk with Jay in the near future. And, and we're going to you know, see if we have some more ideas to come out with another version. Perfect. Well, I'd imagine, yeah, it'd be pretty easy to do if you, you pick 13 flies here. You know, there's thousands of flies, right? You could always, uh, I see a good series here of, of books. This would be awesome. Um, you, you mentioned the Iceland, uh, the Iceland trip. Just want to wrap this up here pretty quick, but on Iceland, it sounds like a cool trip. Is that, was that kind of your bucket list trip or do you have another trip out there you're thinking about maybe doing the next year or so? Gosh, um, I, I have about 800 trips, probably the same as you, Dave. I'm mean, come on. I want to come over and fish with I know. you. You know, I but, know yeah, Iceland was one of these trips where <laughs> a buddy of mine, he, he was going to Iceland. He contacted me. He's like, Hey, um, this trip's coming up in like a month or like two weeks or something. It was really a short turnaround. He was like, I got an extra spot. You know, l- let me know. I'm, I'm sure you can't go, but just let me know. And I was like, yes, I'm in. Like there wasn't even a, it wasn't even a hesitation. I was like, I'm able to go. You know, I was off. It was the summertime. 
And uh, it's my buddy, Rob Janino. He runs the Fly Fishing Journeys podcast. So Rob and I have been very fortunate, you know, because we do content as well for the fly fishing industry, we're able to travel around and see a lot of lodges and and just see a lot of people and and meet a lot of different, you know, fly fishers in all these great destinations. Most of them, whenever we leave, they always say, hey, if you ever want to host a trip here, let us know. And to be honest with you, I've been on a lot of great trips, but it's never been something I've wanted to bring people back to. I've always thought like, I guess I, I'm kind of a DIY guy where I feel like there's so many trips. Like, I just think it's so cool to explore yourself, even though I do get that there's a lot of people who are like, Hey, I don't have time for that. Just show me what I need to do and let me do it. So, so I've kind of shied away from it. And then we went to Iceland and we were there. We had like this incredible experience. I mean, like my first day within my first hour, I hooked like the largest brown trout of my life. So that I was sold. I mean, I was literally sold in my first hour there. So Rob and I, you know, we kind of went back and forth and we're like, Hey, let's, let's host some trips there. So we have, we've, we've had really great success with them. We try to change our trips. So we don't do the same thing every year. We have one coming up in, it's going to be late July, early August of 2022. Um, I mean, it's going to be a seven day trip. Like day one is just kind of a bonus day where we just explore Reykjavik, kind of get to know the group. And then days two and three, we're going to be fishing on these lakes for these ice age brown trout where you have a chance to catch a 30 pound brown trout. I mean, Jeez. sometimes on a dry fly. So right there, like that's crazy. Then we, we leave for a couple of days. We go up into the highlands where you, you know, you have the opportunity to catch Arctic char and brown trout, which is just a blast. I mean, these Arctic char are just, that's a bucket list fish. They're incredible. Plus they're cousins of my Pennsylvania trout, the brook trout. And then, um, we built in for this year, we're going to do some sea run brown trout and Atlantic salmon fishing for the last two days. So we're there at a time where the sea runs are just starting and there's still some Atlantics in the, in the river. So we're, you know, we have like three really unique destinations built into this trip because, you know, cause Rob and I, you know, we love going back to Iceland. Like it's like our home away from home, but we also know that we want to keep it fresh for us too. So, you know, we, we host these trips there they tend to be pretty small trips. I mean, we only bring a handful of people. This isn't like a, you know, we bring everybody and their mother type of trip. It's if you come with us, you know, we're going to be friends at the end of the trip. Like we're all going to hang out. Uh, it's, it's the number one outfitter in Iceland that we use. I mean, the food is just incredible. We have a private chef. So, you know, everything's taken care of. It's one of those trips, but it is a, it's a tricky list it's a list to get on, especially for next year. I think we only have like six open spots and I think maybe four of them are already accounted for. So listen, if people can reach out, if, if it's available, by all means, please come with us, but also know for anyone who wants to do Iceland, um, reach out to me. I'll give you some advice on it. You don't have to take our trip, you know, use me as a resource for Iceland because it's a destination everyone has to experience. Yeah. And what is this like, are you guys at a lodge? Is that sort of thing going back to a lodge? Yeah. They, they, there's an outfitter there called fish partner that we tend to use. They, they, they're the best in Iceland. I mean, to put it in perspective during COVID, we canceled our trip everyone who, you know, was going with us that year got their money back. I mean, there was no questions asked. I know of so many people who lost a lot of money due to canceled trips for, for fish partner. They were like, Hey, if you want to come back next year, great. If not, here's your money back. So, you know, they're a pretty stand up outfitter. Um, yeah, they have a couple lodges that we use whenever we go there. They have a really cool one in the Highlands. It's very European. So it's just, oh, just such a unique little, like little setting. I'm like, I'm back there in my head right now. Um, the other one that we use, there's one that they actually, they put us up in a five-star hotel as well for a couple of nights because of our group. Like they, you know, they kind of, they take care of us because we, we come back every year. So, so I think for our next year's trip, like we'll be in a, we'll be in two different lodges. Um, and then we'll be in this five-star hotel as well. So it's kind of like, we have like a mix of everything on these trips, which, you know, that's why people love to come with us. There you go. All right, Tim. Well, we dug into it again. I think uh, I think maybe the next one we'll have to uh, – maybe we will get you on for that Emerger episode. I, I've always loved Emergers, and uh, <laughs> I, I can watch uh, – you know, I can listen to, to more of uh, Tom's, the episode there, but, uh, you know, definitely would love to dig into more of that. Uh, yeah, anything else that you want to leave us with, you know, flight time-wise? You know, obviously you have the book, uh, you know, in the next year, flight time-wise. Are you just going to keep on the same same track? Anything new coming up with your channel or anything there? Yeah, of course. Well, listen, before I say that, for, I also want to mention to all of your listeners, I've had Dave on my YouTube channel. Dave is tied to Steelhead Fly for my oh, YouTube right. channel. So Dave, yeah. now, now that you've offered like my second time on your podcast, I'm going to offer you a second time on my YouTube channel. So if you want to tie again, or, if you, or if you want to do a, like a little interview, I can interview you since you're the one always asking the questions that that offer is on the table. And I guess that will tie into the, the way my YouTube channel is going now. 
I'm still doing fly time, but I'm trying to just change it up just a little bit because I'm going to go back to the book. There are so many patterns out there and it almost just becomes like, all right, am I just going to keep tying patterns for people on YouTube for the rest of my life? Like that will get boring for me. It will get boring for them. So I'm coming up with topics that are more like outside the box. Like maybe I had a video on the five fly tying tools that I don't need. And then I had another video on the five fly tying tools that I do need. I've been doing a lot of interviews with, you know, some of the leaders in fly fishing. I just had, Land, I had a video with Landon Mayer that just posted. So, and we picked apart, you know, some of his favorite guide flies. So I'm trying to just keep it a little awesome. fresh. So it's not just me tying all the time, but it's also information. And most importantly with YouTube, I love when people comment on my videos. I mean, it just, it, it builds this connection. It builds this community. And, and that's the thing. I mean, I spend most mornings, I wake up and I respond to all the comments. I mean, it takes me a long time. I might, I may not get to your comment for three weeks, but I promise you, I will eventually reply to it. And, and that's, that's part of the fun of YouTube. So yeah, I plan on just, I want to keep kicking out videos there. I have another article for fly tire magazine in the works. So I'm, I'm excited for that. So there's always something on the horizon, Dave. That's very cool. Yeah, I love that you're digging into the interviews a little bit. So this is kind of like I see a I see a podcast, and essentially that is a podcast, right? You're, you're interviewing, and you're kind of doing the same thing we're doing here, right? Is it is that something where you know you these are just short little snippet interviews, or these long like full length? No, I try to keep mine under ten minutes, only because I know. I guess for YouTube, it is nice because YouTube gives you the ability if you want to go longer, that's fine. If you want to have a, a you know a greater An length epic, of the video, right. but I, I know me personally. I tend to watch videos that are in that like six to 15 minute range. That's, that's kind of like my honey zone. So I, I try to keep my own little interviews under 10 minutes, which if somebody was interviewing me, they'd be yelling at me the whole time. But that's, I tend to kind of keep it focused. Like for Landon, I was like, Hey, let's, let's do this. Let's just talk about your three top guide flies. You know, I'll drive the questions. You just answer them. And whenever I stop, that's the sign we're moving on to the next one. And it was the first time he and I had ever worked together and we had a blast like so much that I was like, Hey, we just did this one. Let's do one more while I have you here. So we filmed two in a row and you know, maybe we're going to film some more in the future. So it's, it's cool to see how, you know, that works. But then the other aspect of it, because of the pandemic and because of the use of zoom, it's now given me the ability to record people via zoom. And instead of just, just doing a, a normal zoom interview, I also have the, the ability to edit and edit pictures in. So it's not just people watching you and I talk all the time. Like if, if, if you're talking about a steelhead, then I can, you know, overlay a picture of you holding a steelhead during our interview. So it just takes on that one other aspect, but it's completely different than a podcast because I feel like with podcasts, you truly do get to know both people. And, and I love that about them. That's, I'm sure that's why your listeners keep turning back in, not just to learn about the new people that you have on, but to learn about you. And I think that's kind of, that's the draw to me to podcasts. No, it's true. I, I, you probably see this too. I, sometimes it's tough to take, right? Because, you know, most, most of the time you get good reviews, but occasionally you'll get a bad review. And, <laughs> and I, I got one recently because on a podcast, stuff, I said stuff I usually don't get into, and I didn't even think this was politics, but I mentioned about a show. It was another podcast I listened yeah. to or that I had listened to just a couple times. And, and the person called me out because they're like, yeah, I guess they thought of that person as really political. And I didn't think about it, but I got, I got myself a one-star review because of that. You know what I mean? Oh, so it's like, no. yeah, it's like, well, I know those are tough because you're like, but, but again, I always think of it like, you know what? That's okay for me because I, I'm okay with that because you, you kind of want to have your uh, perspective. Not that I'm a political, real political person or anything, but I like to have a perspective and that's just my, that's who I am. And I think people want to hear just like you, right? They want to hear, they want to get to know you and know who you are. And yeah, I, I don't know those, those negative, I, there's, I don't know. I was, it's funny you bring this up. We won't get down this path too hard, but, but I can tell you prior to my interview with Tom Rosenbauer, somebody had, I had posted this video of me and we were in Iceland and we actually drove across the river and I posted this, this, it, to me, it was just a funny little video of this. And Oh my gosh, Dave, like the, the, oh, really? the fly fishing memes decided to, it was pick on Tim Camisa day and oh, they really? had, they had memes of blowing me up and just all this craziness oh, wow. because they didn't like that. I was destroying habitat where in Iceland, that's the road. And then that's the road. When, even though they knew that they were like, well, you're, you know, you're, you're, I don't know. I don't even remember what it was, but it was hysterical. And I'm like, Oh my God. Uh, I'm like, Heather, you're not going to, I'm talking to my wife. I'm like, Heather, you're not gonna believe this. They're making memes of me now. She's like, for what? And I'm like, I don't even know. So I'm telling Tom this and Tom is like, Tim, I love the memes. Like I like to respond to the meme people. This oh, is really? great. He's like, you want me to go and say something to them? I'm like, no, I've, I've, no, I've blocked them all. I don't, I don't get into this stuff. I'm like, come on. I just want to do this. And he's like, Tim, like, you know, you're doing something if you have memes being created about you. So keep doing it. I'm like, all right, all right. 
That's the point. Yeah, I think that's the point. And, and I do know we are going to test something new just for listeners, you know, listening now at the end of this. Um, we're going to start doing some, we're going to keep doing the full length uh, episodes, but we're also going to start kind of trying some kind of, you know, shorter kind of ask a pro, ask a guest segments that are going to be more of those short little snippets just to see. Uh, you know, if, if that resonates with people. And I think the podcasting thing is great because you can listen to it on the go. You know, right now people are probably running or in their car. It's a little different than YouTube, but whatever they're doing right now, stop what you're doing, go to whatever your, your podcast player is and put a review in for the wet fly swing podcast. And it better be <laughs> a five go. star. You better like this one and look through the reviews and you're going to see one that was posted by Tim Camisa. Cause Dave, I'm oh. going, I'm going to go post one, which they, if this is, you know, we're recording this before they have the opportunity. Nice. So as soon as we're done, I'm going to post a review and it will not be one star. Cause I know what you do for this man. We really appreciate it. That's awesome, man. I appreciate that. That'll that'll help. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get uh, we'll get that one star review uh, buried with some of these good five stars coming up here. That's right. And then and then everybody go to my YouTube channel and you can heckle me because I don't care about one star reviews. You give me all the one star reviews. You heckle me all you want, but give Dave that five star review. Nice, nice, man. Okay, Tim. Well, <laughs> this has been awesome. Uh, <laughs> Troutandfeather.com. I think uh, this is definitely we're gonna get you on for a third time because these are too much fun. And I think you know today again it was kind of random. We we dug into some random stuff a little bit on your book you know i mean i tried to provide some value and i think we did get some great tips i know i learned a lot so i think this is going to be awesome and um yeah man until the next one i appreciate you taking the time today and then we'll look forward to it all right dave thanks for all you do man i really appreciate you so there you go if you want to find all the show notes all links and everything else we cover today head over to wetflyswing.com slash 285 285 will get you to the show notes the links um, and why over on there, we've got a couple of good things that you can find if you head over to the website at that link. Uh, we've got a transcript, which is really cool. And it actually allows you to um, just read, search, whatever you need to do there. Very cool feature. You can check out the website. If you found this podcast helpful, I'd appreciate it if you can uh, leave a review. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash love and leave a review for the show. Love is always, always the ticket here. I don't have anything uh, on tap right now. I know there's another episode on tap, but I don't know what it is. But I want to thank you either way. If you listen or share this week, um, we've pretty much built the this show from the ground up, um, working and doing this side by side with you. If you're brand new to the show, uh, the best way to support it is to uh, subscribe whatever app you're on just click that subscribe button or follow and uh, you'll get updated we also have uh, just recently added uh, to the facebook page a uh, facebook actually allows for listening to the entire episode within facebook so you can go to the go to wet fly swing on facebook you can listen there if that's your app you enjoy um otherwise check out overcast there's a whole bunch of great apps out there where you can listen i actually listen to uh, listen on podcasts on apple podcasts as well as uh, spotify there's all sorts of ways to do it but i uh, just want to thank you before we get out of here deep breath and i will see you hopefully on the river maybe this year we got some big trips coming so let's do it let's get on the river uh, and if not, just connect with me online. Okay, talk to you then. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.